by fireworks and a festive atmosphere prevails. The cause for celebration, the annual arrival of the Grand Sumo Tournament at Aichi Auditorium. Hello, I'm Gary Gerald, and today, a pair of firsts on Sports World. Now, many times in the past, we have brought you Grand Sumo competition, but always from the famed Kabuki-Kan in Tokyo. Today, for the first time, we take leave of the Japanese capital city, and we have come to the city of Nagoya for the annual Basho, or tournament held in this city. The other first pertains to my broadcast colleague, as we welcome to our Sports World crew, actor Pat Morita still basking in the limelight of his tremendous portrayal of Miyagi in the feature film, The Karate Kid. Pat, welcome to Sports World. Oh, thank you very, very much for that, Gary. Great privilege to be here. Uh, the significant first that you refer to is the fact that with this tournament, I become the first Japanese-American in the history of sumo to do television commentary. And we're very proud of that fact. And I know that sumo has a special meaning to you and to members of your family. Oh, yeah. My uh, grandfather was a sumo tori. Uh, he wrestled somewhere between 1880 and 1890 and strictly around the island of Kyushu. He didn't make the big time like this tournament, but he did have a sumo name, Wakayanagi. Well, there's a famed wrestler by the name of Wakashimazu who has captured the fancy of the thousands here at Aichi Auditorium. Thus far, he is the only sumo wrestler who is undefeated. And the crowds here are wondering, can he go through the competition with an unblemished record? One man stands in his way the famed Yokozuna or grand champion Kitano Umi, winner of more than 800 bouts in an illustrious career. Checking the standings to this point, Wakashimazu is mentioned, unbeaten in 12 bouts, two losses for Kitano Umi, Takano Sato, another grand champion, has lost three times. We're going to be missing this man, 20-year veteran Jesse, the famed American, who 12 years ago won the Emperor's Cup here in Nagoya. He is now retired. And on the injury list, Chiyano Fuji, a very popular man known as the Wolf. He will be unable to compete this weekend in Nagoya. This is Itai at 291 pounds. Pat, he's going against the young man that you're really excited about. There he is, my boy, 464 pounds of American Samoan sumo dynamite. Record of seven and five, going against Itai, whose record is the same. Come on, Kony. Anishki, only 20 years of age, making his debut in the upper level of this competition, and he's in trouble right now. Oh, coming back. Indeed making a comeback, but down he goes. Oh. Kanishki, the first to hit the goyo or the ring, and that, of course, means that he has lost this bout. Itai improves his record to eight and five. Kanishki now at seven and six. Well, Gary, I guess it just goes to show that weight isn't everything, but the one thing we can say for Kony is that at 20 years of age, he still has a lot to learn, and he is working on a winning record. And coming up, Wakashimazu will put his unbeaten record on the line against Kitana Umi. Three Auditorium, I'm Gary Gerald, along with Pat Morita, and we're awaiting now a matchup between Ono Kuni, a spoiler who with an 8-4 and four record is still very much in this competition, going against Washiyama. I call him the Terrier, Gary. He's only 5, 8 and a half and uh, a very solid 250 pounds or so. But he's always hanging in there. He's always a very, very exciting little guy. Well, he's a wily veteran. He's 35 years old, whereas Onokuni on the left is only 21. So it's a case of experience now. And the little fellow, Washiyama, appears to be in trouble. And that 120-pound weight differential favoring Onokuni clearly coming into play in this particular match. Washiyama loses. His record goes to 6-7. and seven. Onokuni, on the other hand, now 9-4. and four. Meanwhile, the sense of anticipation building because on the sidelines we see Wakashimazu unbeaten in 12 bouts and Kitano Umi who is second in the standings with two losses. Their very important showdown is coming up shortly. But coming up right now, Gary, is a real good match between Hoshi here in the green. Record of seven and five. He's gonna be going up against, in the black, Ozutsu, record of five and seven. Hoshi's a real crowd pleaser. He's only 21, but very, very popular with the fans. Good hand -tick. Look at the strong slaps. You can hear the crack now of the flesh. Of course, you can't use the fist. You use an open hand. 
and getting the leverage, Ozutsu throws Hoshi from the Goyo, and Ozutsu improves his record. He's not going to be a contender for the championship, but an important victory for him and for Hoshi, the 21-year-old crowd pleaser, there is keen disappointment. But now murmurings through this crowd of 11,000 as we await the showdown between Waka Shimazu and Kitano Umi. Waka watching pensively from the sidelines, remembering the last time he faced Kitano Umi. あの、右の上手を取りました。若島さんはまだ取れません。1枚回しですが、佐野右の上手を引いています。佐野に破る。佐野に破る。やり倒しました。佐野の勝ち。佐野に勝って 14戦全勝です。A memory fresh in the mind of this man, Waka Shimazu, unbeaten now. He lost the last time against Kitano Umi, and in that tournament, it was Kitano Umi who went on to a perfect 15-0 record, one of the winningest of the Sumatori, more than 800 career victories at the upper echelon. But this is a different tournament, and now Waka Shimazu puts his record unbeaten on the line. Both men know the importance of this match, and so does the crowd. themselves. Waka Shimazu trying to offset that 100-pound weight differential that he's giving away to Kitano Umi. And Kitano Umi is down. Waka Shimazu remains unbeaten. He has won now for the 13th consecutive time. And a semblance of vengeance or revenge gain for that loss in the last Grand Basho when Kitano Umi went unbeaten through 15 matches. Virtually no reaction whatsoever from the winner who is now just two steps away from a clean sweep at Nagoya. The clang of a giant cowbell like a raucous trumpet at an American football game. The bell is Europe's call to competition. Bobsledding competition. Now you may have ridden a roller coaster, but this is something else. The ultimate bump and grind. And listen to the crescendo of vibrating sound. Reaching speeds almost 70 miles per hour now. Don't adjust your set. This is the best video possible on this vibrating sled. In fact, at the halfway mark on the track, our camera momentarily conks out. But our driver, he was perfect all the way through, completing this course in fine style. Around the final curve and into the finish line. The camera is skew. You can see the tilted heads here of our four-man team as they come to a stop. And the cheers of satisfaction. They're driving Ron Dunn, but lots of bobsledding coming up as we bring you the World Four-Man Bobsled Championship from Trevinia, Italy. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Lewis. Welcome to Trevinia, Italy, and to the Arrivo Curve, the last of 17 curves on this World Championship track. Now imagine four men tucked into a rocket-shaped bobsled speeding around this corner at 85 miles per hour. Not here, but 10 feet above my head on this vertical wall of ice. It seems unbelievable, but there are 14 countries represented here in the 19th World Championships. With a closer look, let's go to the top and my colleague, two-time U.S. Olympic bobsled driver, Paul Lamy. Greg, the weather conditions here at the top of the hill are absolutely perfect, and the track is in great condition. But the big story is the fact that Wolfgang Hoppe, the East German, who won two gold medals in Sarajevo last year, crashed in his last heat of training and has been eliminated from competition. Let's take a look at that crash. Here they are at the halfway point on the course, the fastest part of the course where this big sled is reaching speeds of up to 85 miles an hour. This is the big right-hand turn that lines him up for the infamous Bianca corner. He's in on time. He's off late. He's on his side, banging all the way down. Watch him bang here. Look at that sled climb up on that wall, hits the lip, which knocks it back down. The heads bang up against that left-hand wall. They're on their sides. They're through the finish. No one seriously hurt everybody on the sled. 
This most Brothers unforgiving Castle. track in Chervinia has claimed the best in the world. Poppy may not be here, but the East Germans are still favored to win. Driving the number one East German sled will be Bernhard Lehmann. This 36-year-old silver medalist at the Olympics in Sarajevo would sure like to win a gold here. And driving the East German number two sled, Datelift Richter, the winner of the two and four-man World Cup here last year. If there's anyone that can catch the East Germans in this championship, it'll be the Swiss. And the one driving the number one Swiss sled is Silvio Giovellina. He was the bronze medalist at the Olympic Games in Sarajevo last year. And Giovellina is challenging. The East Germans are in the lead after two of four runs down this track, but Giovellina only 29 hundredths behind. In third, East German number two, and in fourth, Swiss number two. Let's take a look at the track. Greg, this is a natural ice course. It's one mile in length, has a 450-foot drop, a total of 17 curves, and the big four-man sleds will reach speeds of up to 85 miles an hour on this course. And it's the lower half of the course that is the most demanding, especially the curves Azura Bianca. As Paul, you recall, you almost flipped there. Right, Greg, I remember it well, but that was back in 1971, and I was very lucky to pull it out that day. Here, the Soviets in their second run were not quite so lucky. They're in the lower labyrinth, building up speed, taking the big Azura turn, which lines them up for the Bianca turn. He looks perfect going into Bianca, stayed on the turn a little too long, rolled over on his side, and they're on their head the rest of the way down. Every man in that sled is trying desperately to hold on and stay within the cocoon, if you will, of that sled so that they don't go flying out and really get injured. And all four men did stay within the sled as they went through the finish line, and so they did receive an, an official time. However, they withdrew from the competition. The action just beginning here. We'll be back with more of the four-man Bob World Championships. At the top right now, the driver of the East German number two sled, Datelift Richter. We remember him well, Paul, winning the two and four-man competition last year here in the World Cup bobsledding championship. Datelift has a very good starting team. Let's see how they get in that four-man sled as they push off the top of the mountain. The driver is in, number two man follows him, three, and the brakeman settles down. The time for the first 50 meters, 5.45, only five hundredths off the fastest time. East Germans, extremely good pushers. Going through the big Cristallo turn at the top of the mountain, this is where the uh, sleds are going very slowly, picking up speed as they go through the small labyrinth. A mistake here, a little tap, a skid can be very costly. As a race driver said to me, the difference between racing cars and bobsledding is, in a car we can break. In this, they're always going faster and faster and faster. And it's right at this point in the course that they are really reaching those faster speeds. Going into the Azura corner now, lining himself up for the Bianca turn, in perfectly, and out perfectly, straight as an arrow, nice and clean, going down to the finish David Richter is on a record-setting pace here. His time, 103.31, it is a new track record. His three-run time puts him in first place, 311.44. The East Germans still dominating this track. Their super high-tech sled has done the job again. And now at the top, this is Silvio Joe Bellina, Swiss number one driver. He only weighs 155 pounds. An enthusiastic start, but with his size, he cannot push quite as strong as some of the other drivers. But he gets an awful lot of help from those three men behind him, Greg, and he does have a very fast and good competitive start. Look at that, 552 as he goes into the Cristallo turn. And now, the setup for the ever-building speed. Out of the tunnel, total concentration right here. All he's thinking of, attack the course and be absolutely precise. He's got to be very careful he doesn't overdrive the sled or let the sled get away from him. He's doing just that. He's straight down the middle of those straightaways where the times are slow. Now approaching the big labyrinth turns in the lower half. He's really gaining speed and beginning to fly, Greg. Something else on Joe Bellina's mind. The Swiss have dominated the four-man championship since 1924. They've won it 14 times. He wants number 15, and he wants to take it from the East Germans. A nice kick out of the Bianca turn. Straight as an arrow going into the finish turn. He's really flying, Greg. Around the last curve, he'll finish in 103.61. It'll put him back into first place after three or four runs. About a tenth in front of Dayton Richter. Bernard Lehman of East Germany yet to come, though. And now his own teammate is challenging. This is Swiss number two, Ralph Pickler at the controls. And he was the 83 World Two-Man Champion. A strong starting team. Let's take a look at the rhythm and timing as they get in the sled. The driver's already settled in, number two, number three man, all nice and smooth. 
The fastest 50 meter start time on the lower left of your screen, 5.40. The time for Pickler's team, 5.45. Only 500 slower than the fastest, but 700 faster than his teammate, Joe Bellina. And here on the upper half, where the times are slow, he's trying to drive through the bottoms of all these turns. Again, not trying to overdrive the sled, nor trying to let the sled get away from him, trying to keep it straight down those long straightaways. Now he's going into the Great Labyrinth, where he's picking up a lot of speed. Remember, this track is one mile long, 450-foot vertical drop, 17 curves. It's a challenge every inch of the way, and it's natural ice, which is rougher than the refrigerated ice at some tracks, like Lake Placid, for example. Lined up perfectly going into Bianca. Out of the Bianca turn. Look at that. Nice and straight, going down into that finish turn. Has a nice line through the finish turn. He's having a great time. 103.66, a good run, but about five tenths slower than he would have needed to take the lead. Three run time, 311.83. He's in third right now, but the man to beat is coming up, getting his sled ready. East Germany's Bernard Lehman. <laughs> One of the kings of sumo competition, grand champion Yokozuna Takanasato, now preparing for his next mark. And it wasn't too many months ago that he became a newlywed. And when a Yokozuna gets married in Japan, it is big news. You see the size of that Yokozuna wedding cake. <laughs> Almost as big as Takanasato himself, a man who weighs 335 pounds. He's preparing now to go against. Hoko Tenyu, and this should be a very interesting match. Hoko Tenyu with an 8 and 5 record. Taka Nosato, 9 and 4. In fact, there's been some concerns that Taka has perhaps not measured up their expectations from the time he has become married. Some say he's going through a period of readjustment, Gary, with a new wife and a house and their grand reputation to uphold. He was fighter of the year a year ago. But in trouble now, Hoko Tenyu forcing Takanasato from the ring, and Hoko Tenyu's record improves to 9 and 5. So we've come now to the next major test for Wakashimazu. He has won 13 consecutive bouts. He's only two away from an unblemished, a perfect record for this tournament. But he goes up at against an unknown opponent. That's right, Kirishima. 8-5, and five, and the fact that these two have never faced each other before makes it a situation where I can't wait to see what will happen. And as we see the two in the ring, you can't help but notice the similarity in body style. Karishima only 251 pounds, but then as we pointed out earlier, Wakashimazu only 276 pounds. But this is the debut by Karishima in this division, and what a tremendous boost to his reputation if he could upset Wakashimazu. trying to get a little extra leverage. He's on the right in the green Mawashi or silken loin cloth. He clearly has the advantage now. Kishima gave it his best shot. A little smile of satisfaction for his effort there. Something you rarely see any type of reaction whatsoever, but apparently Kishima quite proud of his performance, even though it's a losing role to this man. Waka Shimazu now one step away from a perfect record here at Nagoya. We'll be back with more sumo later. People milling about the track here at the World Four Man Bobsledding Championships in Chervinia. There's been a stop in the action, a terrible crash. Klaus Kopp of West Germany, here it was. Entered Bianca very nicely. Got off the turn late on his side. Now watch him as he goes through the finish turn. Hits that lip, does a complete pirouette in the air, comes down backwards. They did not finish the course, so they didn't get a time, but it made no difference here. They were happy to be alive. They had crashed through the retaining wall at the top of the Arrivo curve, brought down shards of wood, jammed into the sled. No one hurt. Amazing. On their sides, going into the finish turn, as they start to climb to hit that lip, one of the pushers from the side must have gotten caught right here as the sled flips. All four men barely able to stay in the sled as they come down literally on their heads in the bottom of the corner. You can see the wood splinters flying all over and take a look at what the front and the side of that sled looked like when they pulled it out of the track. A 600-pound bob crushed like a child's plastic toy. But the race goes on again, and it's Bernard Lehman at the top of East Germany. He must be thinking about something else as well, another crash. The crash of Wolfgang Hoppe, gold medalist in the two and four man in Sarajevo, the best driver in the world. He went down in Azura Bianca. With Hoppe out, Lehman is the favorite, and he's still not afraid of Azura Bianca. I think, uh, 
dass diese Kurve sehr gut zu fahren ist. Das Problem ist, wenn man that, uh, uh, doch, wenn man mehrmals hinuntergefahren ist, dass man sehr selbstsicher wird, uh, uh, dass man dann versucht, uh, wenn mein Kollege Hoppe tippt, hat es mich zwar nicht gedacht, aber ich habe es gar nicht gedacht, und ich habe es nicht gedacht, weil wenn man in dieser Kurve mit viel Vertrauen ist, dann wird man die Fehler machen. Und ich denke, mein Kollege hat es gemacht. An interesting thought, too much confidence, he blames for his crash. And they're off, their third of four runs. A great starting team, Greg, the driver is in. Number two man tripped a little bit going in there. All in and underway. Lehman, a man of great experience, in 1976 won a gold medal, but he was the four-man brake man back then. We're looking at 1,389 pounds of men and machine as it hurtles down the side of this mountain. Right now in the upper labyrinth where the times are slow and he cannot afford to get into any skids or taps. And you can see he's handling that sled perfectly, holding it right straight down the middle. Now going into the grand labyrinth where the speed is all made up. At the second split, his time 2200s faster than anyone else, and now ahead works Azura Bianca. He is really flying, going into the Azura turn. This is going to line him up for the Bianca corner. Straight, clean, into Bianca. A beautiful line out of the Bianca turn. Look at him, straight. Those little taps won't mean much. He's going much too fast. Through the finish line, 102.97, the first man ever to break the 103 barrier. No problem with Azura Bianca and Bernard Lehman with a 310.4 for three runs is back in the lead again. The East Germans, extraordinary. So now the battle is for second place. Switzerland's Joe Bellina leading the East Germans by only 11 hundredths. The fourth run will decide it all. Back once again in Nagoya, Japan, I'm Gary Gerald, along with Pat Morita, and at the opening of our show today, we alluded to the role that you played of Miyagi in the feature film, The Karate Kid. While we're awaiting our next bout, let's take a moment and look at one of the clips from that fine film. Johnny, leave him alone, man. He's had enough. All the sides, but he's had enough, man. What is wrong with you, Johnny? The enemy deserves no mercy. Right, right, right. You're crazy, man. <laughs> This is Asasio, 401 pounds strong. He goes against Kitana Umi, 375 pounds. Now, Asasio is in the rank known as Ozeki. That's just one step below that of grand champion. He's on the right now, and here we go. Big boys here, Gary. They're both trying to get control of the Mawashi. Gotta have that leverage, these big guys. Tatarumi is taking charge as he suddenly turned his opponent around and tossed Asasio out of the ring. If indeed you can toss 400 pounds out of the ring. Kitana Umi's record improving now to 11 and 3. He has won 24 tournaments in a great career. A lot of people thought perhaps that he had seen his better days, Pat, but he is wrestling strong again, it appears. Yeah, and he'd like to uh, wind up the career on a, on a high note. Our next battle, Onakuni, 10 and 4, going against the crowd favorite, Hoshi, who is 8 and 6. A weight differential here of about 70 pounds. Hoshi's got a lot of fans here. The pressure's really on him. Uh-oh, trouble. And he's battling back beautifully, and Hoshi will get the win. Got him. Tremendous comeback performance. Hoshi looked like he was right up against the wall, but instead, he stops Onokuni. Onokuni's record 10 and 5, and Hoshi will be 9 and 6 in their final bout here in Nagoya. And right now, all eyes focused on this man. And Waka Shimazu go 15 and 0 and keep a perfect record intact. The IT Auditorium capacity crowd, 11,000 now, waiting in anticipation of the showdown match as Wakashimazu, who has clinched the competition, seeks to become an undefeated warrior here in 15 bouts. But first, we have a battle of the Yokozuna, the grand champions, Kitano Umi versus Takana Sato. And normally, Pat, this would be the feature event. This would be what everyone is waiting for, but not today here in Nagoya. 
got what's going on here is called Yokozuna Pride. Taka Masato, 9-5, Kitano Umi, 11-3. Their final showdown in this Grand Basho. 9-5, nine, nine wins is not good for Yokozuna. You gotta have 10 or better. Good match. Taka Masato, who won here one year ago. He's the defending Nagoya champion. Kitano Umi, who was perfect in the last tournament held just recently. He won all 15 bouts, but he's lost three times thus far. He's trying to save some pride right now as well. Trying to get some Mawashi control here. Needed for leverage. Advantage Taka Masato, and it's over just that quickly. While they were trying to fight for control of the Mawashi and get that position of leverage, Kitano Umi appeared to slip just a bit, and Taka Masato quickly took advantage and just backed his opponent out of the ring. So Taka Masato ends at 10 and 5. And look at the intense concentration in the eyes of these two rivals. Everyone's talking up Wakashimazu as the next Yokozuna, Gary. And he cannot tolerate a single loss. That's the only way to get there. Here we go. Incredibly fast start. Tremendous contact on the initial surge. Both men now pausing, trying to get repositioned and get their breath. Wakashimazu trying to get some leverage. Now backing off once again. Still neither man in clear control. Many feel that Wakashimazu may have blown a golden opportunity in the last tournament when he lost six times to become the next grand champion. He's trying to make amends here at Nagoya. He's been wrestling beautifully. Uh-oh. See a little blood trickling out of the nostril of Wakashimazu. That's something that we haven't seen in any of the prior matches. Here's a surge now by Wakashimazu. He wins it. He got it. Great moment for Waka. Great moment for these people. Great moment for Sumo. 15 and 0. Waka Shimazu in line possibly to become the next grand champion. Caps a perfect slate here with a victory over Kodokazi, a man he had beaten only four times in 18 previous matches. <laughs> Look at this leg drive. Look at this determination. Look at the look on Kodokazi's face. And he knows there's nothing he can do about it. Great win for Wakashimazu. And the final standing show Wakashimazu alone at the top, unbeaten in 15 bouts. Kitano Umi second at 11 and 4. Well, Pat, I don't think there's any question this Grand Basho turned out to be every bit as exciting as everyone thought coming in. Oh, boy. Superb tournament. Um, historic performance by Wakashimazu. 15-0. No one does that too often. Uh, and everyone's saying the next Yokozuna. Indeed. Remember, there have only been 59 in the long history of the sport. It certainly looks like Wakashimazu is on his way to becoming the 60th. That's the story from Nagoya. For Pat Morita, I'm Gary Gerald saying so long for Sports World. Thank you, Gary. Coming up, more of the world bobsled championships from Italy. But first, as you've seen, champions come in all shapes and sizes, the sumo wrestlers. Linda Fradiani also claimed her title in Japan. That's the subject of our years ago today. The passage of sports time. The moments are brief, but the memories are lasting. Today, we remember one of those moments, and it's brought to you by Prudential for Life, Health, Auto, Home. Get a piece of the rock. Prudential Insurance. On March 3rd, 1977, this baby had come a long way to fulfill a childhood dream, winning the world figure skating title. 1977 was the year Linda Fratiani took off as a skater. Like most success stories, it didn't happen overnight. Skating has meant my life to me. It's something that I've been doing since I was nine years old. It's um, been an everyday part of my life. Her dedication was in part rewarded that year when she captured the U.S. ladies' crown. But in March, her triumph was complete. 
Uh, winning the world title in 1977 was one of the greatest thrills of my skating career, and it was almost like a dream come true then. But it was a dream that almost did not come true for the 16-year-old skating sensation. After the compulsory figures, Linda was in fourth place. It was in the short program that Linda made her move, skating a flawless and technically brilliant performance. I felt like I had nothing to lose. I felt I had everything to gain, and I went in there um, and just skated. I remember it. I did a really good short program, and I gave it my all because, as I said, I had nothing to lose. When she had finished, she had leapt from fourth to first in the standings. But her happiness was short-lived as joy turned to uncertainty. There was a um, little bit of a problem at that competition because I had an inner ear staph infection and my balance was off and I really wasn't sure if I was going to skate the wrong program. I was that sick and with the doping control, I wasn't able to take any medication. So, going into the long program is, you know, you're there, this is what you've worked for, and just go for it. And going into it, uh, my first triple jump, I fell. And I got up, and I was mad, and I'm a fighter, and I got up, and I did another triple jump after that, and two more double axles, and I won, and it was the greatest feeling. Winning the World Championship in 1977 was just the beginning for Linda Fratiani. As an amateur and as a pro, she has always displayed the same determination that marked her for success eight years ago today. I think being a champion means not whether you win or lose, but knowing that you've given it your all. All four men are loaded in the sled, 1,389 pounds of men and machine again, going through the Cristallo turn, that tunnel underneath the roadway in the upper half. Joe Bellina has been driving for 10 years. He is now 30, and he is representative of the new generation of Swiss drivers. Their best drivers in the past have been in their 40s. So, Paul, obviously, this is a game where experience plays a big role. And he has an experienced riding team behind him. If you'll notice, the three men sitting behind him are tucked right in. They know exactly where they are all the way down the mountain and can help him in the turns if he gets off a turn late by throwing their weight up on it. Right now, coming off of Azura, entering Bianca. A nice line through Bianca. Look at how straight he managed to hold that sled in there. A little skid right there. That won't hurt him. He's moving so fast. And the finish. He will not break the 103 mark. His time, 103.48. It is his best run of the championship though and now at the top of the course making his fourth and final run it will be Bernard Lehman he has been on a championship team but he has never won the gold medal as a driver only as a brakeman now is his chance look at the power of that snap Greg as they're getting off the top of the mountain Lehman is in his position number two number three Brakeman gets in everything is all locked up before they even get into that first small turn 545 start a good competitive start they're getting the most out of their sled, and this is the last year you will see this East German sled in competition. They introduced their high-tech hydraulics in 1977, but now they have been disallowed for next year because the other bobsledding nations say the East German sled is just too expensive for them to build. Next year, all teams will race on a sled, much like the Swiss have right now, and Paul's standardization will be an interesting equalizer. But right now, it is laying out in front. And he is flying through the great labyrinth in the lower half. He's going into the Azura turn, which will line him up for Bianca. Let's see how he holds it. Nice and clean out of Azura. Clean into Bianca. And a beautiful line going to the finish turn. He is really flying, Greg. A nice line through the finish. He breaks the finish beam at 85 miles per hour. His time, 103.66. An incredible four-run total. That is 21 seconds faster than in the World Championships on this same track 10 years ago. It seems first place is locked up. Dateliff Richter yet to come, but he could catch the Swiss, who are now in second. Has had its difficulties in this four man world championship. This was earlier, Greg, and Jeff Jost's team here gets a good snap out of the blocks, but unfortunately, when the brakeman changes his hand gripping position, he loses the sled and has to run to catch up with it so that he can make it for the ride down. It seemed a little bit like the Keystone Cops. Too bad for Jeff Jost. He was fifth in Sarajevo, and actually, the start wasn't all that bad. Only three tenths off the pace. The Americans finished 11th overall. But so far, there have been no mistakes by this man's team, Dateliff Richter, last year here at the World Cup competition. He was first in the two-man and in the four-man. 
he is a precision machine. And now he has to be quicker than 103.36 to take second place. They are off the final and fourth run. A good snap, and as you can see, the rhythm, all the legs are running together. Number two, number three man, driver is already in. The brakeman gets in, pulls down those two pushers, underway again before they even get into that corner. 5.48, a great start. No wonder it is picture perfect. They train for months and months and months, almost a year-round training program for the East Germans to try to perpetuate their winning tradition. First and second in the four-man at Sarajevo. They have a chance to be first and second in the world championships here. Date of Richter at the controls. And is that sled handling beautifully? Look at the aerodynamic design of that sled. It's no wonder they're so far ahead. He is really picking up speed now in this lower great labyrinth. Richter must be faster than 103.36 to take second place away from Joe Bellina. Here he is in the Azura turn, lines himself up beautifully for the Bianca corner. Out of there, absolutely clean. A little tap right there, that won't slow him down. A beautiful line through the finish, nice and clean. And he is through 103.19, he will take second place away from the Swiss, and the East German control of the sport continues. First and second place, and Dave Richter, the silver medal, and he is proud of it. So here are the final standings, the top three within 75 hundredths of one another. And the East Germans have picked up their sixth world championship title in just eight years. Paul, your thoughts? Craig, as we watch the closing ceremonies, I can't help but think of the charge the Swiss made in trying to catch the East Germans. And I can't wait to see what will happen next year when they're all driving standardized equipment. Well, the sleds may be the same in 86, but will everyone else have the same discipline and great athletes that the East Germans have? We'll find out in 1986 when we bring you the four-man championships from Koenigsee, West Germany. But now, from the Matterhorn in Trevini, Italy, ciao for Paul Lamy, I'm Greg Lewis.